Welcome to AOE Live, episode number seven. We are recording this show live on Tuesday, May 26th. We'll be, jo- we'll be joined tonight by the Art of Education founder, Jessica Balsley, who will talk to us about work and life balance, why you should quit multitasking, and why positivity should drive your teaching. I'm Tim Bogatz, a high school teacher from Omaha, Nebraska. And I'm Andrew McCormick. I'm a middle school art teacher from Cedar Falls, Iowa. And like Tim said, we're joined tonight by Jessica Balsley, the founder of AOE. She is a wife, mom, speaker, entrepreneur, graduate instructor, former art teacher, and four short years ago, she set out on a mission with her husband, Derek, to found AOE and provide ridiculously relevant PD for art teachers and created the Art of Ed. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. <laughs> All right. Thanks it's for It's kind of fun us. to We're finally be on the show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, very cool. Yeah, you've been sitting back watching for the last six I've enjoyed episodes. It. So. I've enjoyed it a ton, and I just want to say thanks to you guys. You're uh, awesome hosts, and we've had a lot of fun watching you, and I'm glad to be here tonight, so thank you. Aw, shucks. We, we've had a lot of fun doing it, too. <laughs> uh, we want to say hello to those of us joining us for the first time. Uh, we know a lot of people have questions for Jessica, uh, so start firing away. Yep, and we'll be on the AOE live page. You can ask us questions. You can like upvote things with the Crowdcast, um, which is really great. Currently, I'm juggling a couple different Gmail accounts, so if something looks weird, it comes across. I might be typing as Jessica, but as me, um, just forgive that. But it's a really great way to participate and kind of upvote people's questions, so we really dig it. All right. And always, uh, once we're done tonight, the podcast will be available on the AOE Live page and will go up later this week on iTunes and Stitcher. Listen to it on your drive to school, at home in the evening, or even during your plan time. All right, so Jessica, the first thing that I want to talk to you about is something that I actually heard that that I was actually shocked to hear you say a couple weeks ago, maybe a week ago on another podcast I listened to, the Slow Hustle podcast. Um, your husband Derek was on it a while ago, and that got me kind of hooked on that. It's this great entrepreneur um, podcast out there. And, and the host asked you something about work-life balance, and I know I've heard you talk about that in the past, and I was sitting there thinking, oh, I kind of know what Jessica's going to say. And what she said on that podcast blew me away. I did not see that coming. So I know that family is super important to you, but I'm going to sneak into the answer a little bit. Do you think that there is such a thing as a work-life balance? Well, that's a loaded question, but um, I I would say I I used to think there was such a thing. I used to think I could control it and I could make it just how, you know, my mind envisioned it. And um, I've kind of thrown in the towel and said, nope, there is no such thing as work-life balance. But it's kind of of interesting because the definition of balance is um, two things that are equally proportioned. So it doesn't mean they have to be 50% and 50%. So um, the way I kind of think about it is there's different proportions of balance, but you still have to stay balanced. So when you're putting on an art show, you might be giving 70% to your work life and, you know, a little bit less to your family life. But once that's over, you can swing it back and maybe you have a day off and it's more back to family. So um, as long as your proportions still add up to 100, you're going to not feel as overwhelmed. And that's when we try to do too much and, you know, plan a family reunion the same weekend as our art show and then we're like off the charts and um, and then it's not in equal proportions. So I think that's kind of the way I thought about balance, um, kind of to overcome that mom guilt too. And we all kind of have that family guilt, like I should be doing this, I should be doing that. And when you know that the pendulum can swing back and be a little bit more balanced the other direction, I think it gives you that peace of mind that it doesn't have to be perfectly balanced. Mm-hmm. And I also kind of yeah. think that, um, you know, people who um, are go-getters or, you know, like I always think about like Einstein or something like that uh, to make a huge comparison. They didn't worry about being balanced all the time. Like, oh, I have to stop doing this because I, I might push myself too far. Um, if you're passionate about something, you do need to push to that next level, give it a little more to um, kind of get yourself to that higher level of whatever it is you're trying to achieve. So um, that's kind of the way I see the work-life balance, and I try to turn it on and off quickly. So if I have something, I get a quick call, then I can quickly flip back to my family, and then I can quickly flip back. So it doesn't have to be hours of one thing and hours Mm -hmm. of the other. Mm -hmm. And being able to switch fast has helped me be more present, and it's obviously something I know we're all still working on. Um, But that's kind of the way I envision it. I want to interject here a little bit. I wonder what that switch fast looks like, Um, because I know sometimes 
you know, we, we say and we, we try not to bring work home with us both uh, physically but then also like emotionally or spiritually dwelling on something that didn't go well or letting something eat at you. Do you have some strategies for how you can kind of like, all right, I'm done with that and now it's like it's family time because I've done my time in this and in that switch fast. How, how have you been able to do that over the last few years? Well, um, I read a really good book called The Four Agreements by Don Ruiz Miguel. You have to look it up. And it is um, one of the four agreements is take nothing personally. And that one really stuck with me because I think the reason we hold on to things, like we're thinking about what our principal said to us at school or we're thinking about what our colleague said and did or our you know spouse. And when we hold on to it, it's because we took it too personally. And so I try to... N- not take things as personally but take them for face value so if someone asks me you know where is the paperwork or where is that um, the art needs to be turned into the district office I don't take it as they're out to get me they're mad at me it's just they really just want to know where it is so you just try to answer the question and move on and it's so hard I'm working on it like every single day and um, you know even when I went um, I was in Arizona and I was speaking at their state conference and I had like uh, left a bunch of like casseroles in the freezer for my family and um, I got there and I was you know feeling good it was really early in the morning and I texted my husband like don't forget the daycare bag you know because you're living in both worlds and I accidentally yeah. texted the president of Arizona Art Educator <laughs> uh, don't forget the diaper bag and <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's awesome. yeah that's and I was just like you know what it's just part of it too I mean we are living in all those worlds master jugglers but um, you know that's kind of how I switch fast. Just don't linger and keep going. And um, yeah, yeah, and that's something that you know I've kind of tried to find a balance with too. Because I feel like, like you said, like life and work are so interconnected. Because when I'm at school, I'm constantly talking about my kids, talking about my family. Because I want my kids to, you know, at school to get to know me, and you know, they're gonna know something about my family. And yet, at the same time, like when I'm at home, I'm constantly thinking about school too. Not necessarily in a bad way, but just coming up with new ideas and you know, different things that we can do. And the the key for me is to just kind of, you know, get that idea written down, put down somewhere, and then just kind of move back to what we're doing. Like, one of my favorite lessons that, that I teach came to me while I was literally taking my kids out for ice cream. And so I just had to, you know, jot it down real quick in the sketchbook and then put that away and, and get back to our ice cream. But the, the thing is, you know, just don't spend too much time with that. And I, I think that's a big, um, big key or a good way to, to find that balance. Hey, Tim, I want to ask you a a question really quick. Um, You know, I know we brought Jessica on, and here I am asking you. I can ask you a question anytime I want, but, and this pertains to all of us. You know, we all have kids, and I think I might have the oldest. um, My daughter's 11, and I know, Jessica, your daughter is pretty young. Um, Do you guys think that becoming parents made you better teachers, and being a teacher has made you a better parent? Because I find those things to be really symbiotic. Yeah, um, for me, I honestly, I think it made me a worse teacher, but I'm okay with that. Oh, no, because, man. No, honestly, like, my wife's a teacher, too, and before kids, like, we just spent so much time mm-hmm. at work, you know, so, so much time at school coming up with ideas together and hanging work, and I just put, like, all of my effort into school. And we were fine with that. And once kids came along, you know, that changed a little bit. And I didn't care nearly as much about Mm -hmm. school. You know, and that's not to say I don't care because I still very much do. I'm still very passionate about what I do. But I don't put in the hours that I used to. And, you know, I I may not be as good of a teacher because of that. But, like I said, I'm, I'm perfectly okay with that. That's, that's really interesting. I never thought of it because I know I started teaching when my oldest daughter was like one and a half. So like I've never yeah. known teaching without kids. Okay. Interesting. I, I like your honesty though, Tim, as far as just saying like, you know, I can't do this job as thorough as I could. I feel the exact same way and um, I just think it's okay to admit that. I mean, I think it happens to every parent, 
when they're working and trying to juggle all of that. Um, I kind of had a little rule for myself as well. Like I did, um, you know, before I had my daughter, I would uh, practice like getting out at contract time. Like I had this little like race. It was like a game for myself to get out of school at contract time, which meant yeah. I had to manage my time much more efficiently during the day. Um, yeah. And I had to really do a lot of techniques, which I'll share too, to try to, you know, manage that time. And it was um, really great because we do have lives outside of mm -hmm. school and work and, and our email is on these little devices that have slowly like crept into our lives and so I mean we really can't get away from it but um, trying to leave at least so many days a week at your actual um, contracted time is huge yeah. I mean so many teachers don't yep very true like I don't know I, I think art teachers are notorious for staying after and doing whatever whether that's organizing or grading projects or checking out sketchbooks or whatever else we're we're terrible about that but um, just kind of you know segueing with that along the lines of, of time management uh, I know you've written a lot about that before and you've talked about the technique of layering and personally I always want to do better than you know being in a constant state of rush and a constant state of worry so um, you know with that idea of layering can you explain kind of your advice for for finding more time uh, in the day absolutely well there's multitasking which we know there's a lot of research out there now that says you're not supposed to multitask because you are doing two high-level things back and forth and you may never finish one but um, layering is better and layering is where you're doing one higher level task with another more mindless task and what layering does is not necessarily get you to do more like for example you could be grading while you listen to a podcast maybe AOE live mm -hmm. um, but you know you are fulfilling and feeding kind of your soul almost so you may say to yourself at the end of the day I did nothing for myself I didn't get to listen to my favorite podcast read my favorite magazine but when you're layering you can actually accomplish both and you feel like you got that in you did something other than your work topic or your family topic and so I I mean I listen to podcasts and um, music or books on tape while I'm doing dishes while I'm driving while I'm working on lower level tasks and it's just um it's been really positive in my life because I'd rather feed my head with those things than um, something that might be negative or my own thoughts, which we know they can carry us away too. <laughs> Do you have a favorite layering technique? Uh, these two things together go well, like uh, peanut butter and jelly. Like I, I wonder what your go-to uh, higher lower functionings are that you get down with. Well, I would say mostly like a lot of times like physical activity things like if you're in the art room for example and you need to wash paint brushes organize artwork take things off the drying rack you needed a physical break anyway from your mental work mm -hmm. and so doing physical things while listening to a podcast or a book on tape or mm -hmm. just getting your exercise while or getting some fresh air while you're grading or you know doing some things like that or while you're cleaning up your art room that is layering because you actually got out of your chair because at the end of the day once you sit down at your desk and see the sea of email that is flooded in all day it can be really hard to um, just not get back up and clean up the art room and that's yeah. the hardest thing about being an art teacher too I think are you know it's hard to take artwork home to grade it's hard to, you can't take paintbrushes home to wash you can't mm -hmm. do those things and so you have to do things while you're there and you can check your email at home you know things like that so those are kind of my favorite you know layering techniques yeah um, you know and along the same lines there's so many distractions that we have from like you said email get back to this parent right away or check that email or update this or share that or blog this or like this you know um, I mean how do you think about how do we, how do we continue to do what we do well but then still satisfy all those different demands of well this has to be done and this has to be done and this has to be done is it all just layering, or are there some other you know techniques that you have about that? Well, I think it's not easy. I must put that out there. I struggle with it every day because there's so much coming at us, and I think again, I've been really um, I can shut it off and turn it on really quickly again. I think that's one of my one of my tricks for that, and um, just uh, realizing that your smartphone, like I put a lock on my smartphone. Um, for like having to punch in a code so it makes it harder to go on there and browse something and you know being a social company being an online company social media is a huge part of what we do and um, you know just taking that in doses and not having to always see what the next comment is um, yeah. even though it's there is huge for me um, 
because there's always something so new to, to see and um, something cool to look at and it just um, yeah. you just have it's just always going to be there it's just, these this is our lives so so yeah just censoring yourself and um, kind of just putting it away do you ever do like uh, tech free weeks or tech free days or Amish Sunday I mean like where you just like <laughs> shut down all the tech and and just kind of uh, uh, fast on all that stuff? Well, not in our family. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. no, it's pretty important to stay connected for Derek and I with the Art of Ed, but um, I'd like to do more of it. I try to do it for myself a little bit, but no, that's just, we just have to switch back yeah. and forth really quickly, so, but. You know, I know as a, as a personal, you know, just I, I'm not concerned or worried about running a business, so I don't have to keep those things up and running, but I think on the podcast I listened to, you mentioned that you took Facebook off the phone. So you're still able to check Facebook when you really, really, really want to and you're sitting down and it was a destination. But taking it off your phone, it's like I'm not looking at it when I'm just bored because I know for me, like, I can look at Twitter and an email quick and then stop it. If I look at Facebook, like, I'm in there for 10 minutes and before you know it, it's cute. Yeah cat videos and it's you know links to articles that I should read and it's just like it's such a time suck so I that has really helped me out in the last couple of weeks I've done that I did I did do that as well and mm -hmm. it, it does become a destination and there's lots of great things and I love you know seeing what all the AOE you know fans are saying and mm -hmm. um, but maybe just not like while I'm trying to put my kid to bed or doing other things like that so yeah. So yeah, it's been a really healthy thing. I just think a lot of us, we don't know how to deal with some of the technology that's come our way. Like our world has just exploded and um, it takes a long time to figure out how this fits into our life. And once you can kind of make rules for yourself, like I always also say like, what are you not willing to sacrifice? Like mm -hmm. I may not be willing to sacrifice um, time at the park with my daughter and I'm going to really just put it away during then because mm -hmm. that's what my vision for my you know parenting life looked like and it didn't look like browsing a smartphone while my daughter was playing at the park mm -hmm. you know and so it's just kinda of to think about those things like if you were looking at your life from the outside Oh gosh, now I'm depressed. Jeez. <laughs> I'm not saying this. I always do it. I'm saying it's hard. It's yeah, just... all the snapshots of me pushing my kids on the swing while like looking at my phone, being that dad. No, I try not to ever do that because I don't like those people when I see them. But I know I've been that person occasionally. <laughs> yeah, I think we all do that. But you know, like my rule is, yeah, you know, I just try not to let my phone get in the way of conversations with my kids or with my family, mm -hmm. and so. You know, from when we get home until when we put the kids to bed, I usually try and put the phone away. And, you know, obviously that's not always going to work, but I hate trying to have a conversation, you know, with my seven-year-old while I'm also looking at my phone. And I think that, you know, detracts a lot. Uh, and I think being in a school setting... Uh, does that as well because I've noticed that kids are so bad at conversations these days because they're so used to just staring at their phone mm -hmm. and I just have nightmares of my own kids like not knowing how to talk to adults because they're constantly looking at that phone mm -hmm. and so I don't want to be that that example you know I want to put that away and have real conversations with my kids so that's kind of a, a big thing for me is just trying to keep the tech out of there when it is family time so absolutely uh, but uh, anyway, I, I think we're probably ready to move on. So, uh, Jessica, I wanted to talk a little bit with you about, uh, you know, the Art of Ed as a company, you know, kind of where you've come from and, you know, where you're going to be going in the future. So can you talk a little bit, um, for those people that don't know, about how you start AOE? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I had done all of my master's research on um, professional development and when it was relevant to art uh, educators or any content area, how it improved attitudes. I'm all about attitude. And yeah. so I had a um, like a really high up person in my district who had to approve my research, um, read my abstract, and she was like, oh, I never thought about attitudes. I just thought what the research said was what everyone should do. Um, I never thought about how it really, the attitude mattered of impacting teachers. And she was planning all the professional development for this huge district. And I just thought to myself, well, if you don't have buy-in, if you don't have positive attitudes, how are you going to get any teacher to jump on a bandwagon for a new initiative? Yep. And so I just think attitude is totally um, 
underplayed and not looked at enough because that's the first step. And so I guess I did this big, you know, huge research paper, and I'm a doer. I'm just an take action, and I decided that I wanted to do something as a result and be a part of the change I wanted to see. And so I um, started a blog called The Art of Education, and I just talked about my own um, thoughts in the art room, my own issues, and I'm a super practical person, so like, you know, I would drive home every day and, you know, base my worth on if my students were listening to me in the art room or if we got cleaned up in time and I beat myself up yeah, about that. Yeah. Just talking about a lot of those real issues where I was just like, hey, this is hard. Is it hard for anyone else? And so I just started um, talking about my experiences and um, it has grown um, from there to a magazine and um, online courses and online conferences and just kind of an online hub for art teachers um, and it's just been a blast. I mean, yeah. kind of never knew um, it would take this form, but it's mm -hmm. fun to um, help more students than I was in the classroom through the Art of Ed, so um, absolutely. So, you know, Jess, one of the things you mentioned is how attitude can affect, you know, how, how you think about your job and how you perform. One of the things I also want to ask you about, because I know this comes up a lot with, with, with teachers and myself, I worry about it, and, and it got me thinking about something I saw in your Instagram feed, was how do we balance our own health and work issues? You know, we've talked about family and work, balance, how it exists, how it fluctuates. What about how we try to even keep our own selves physically fit, but then also just nourished and avoid that kind of burnout. Do you have some tips on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that not taking your work home was huge for me, um, trying not to take as much as I could home, um, and also just knowing that there's different seasons of your life for different things. And so um, if you are in a really starting a new job in a new city and you just moved, you may not have as much time to hit the gym or to go to your favorite yoga class and you know that this is a season of your life where you are on kind of this path, but you know that the season will flip and change. And you know, after having kids, you know, seasons change, things change, mm -hmm. and then we can always get back. It's always a choice, and you can flip the switch really quickly. Um, they say, you know, I'm, it's a lot about habits too. They mm -hmm. say that it takes, you know, 21 days to build a habit, and I, um, from the stuff I've read, that's maybe not true. Um, the way I found to form habits, new habits, um, is just saying it's just what I do. And so um, it's not this big epic thing like I know I used to take like my gym clothes with me to work and stop by afterwards and like it was this big epic thing and I would just get so like worked up about it because it was just this, no, it's just what I do. And some days I can't, but most days I can. And I think it's also about getting, you know, we all have the same 24 hours in the day, right? But how do some people yeah. seem to either accomplish more or be calm about it? Like, it doesn't mean mm -hmm. doing more is better. I'm just saying some people seem to have this calm about them. And I'm not calm. Like, <laughs> I'm no. anything but calm. <laughs> not, not but I all. like, but that's, um, you know, how I roll. But I'm, I'm cool with that for the most part. But um, this, I'm obsessed with this idea of your ideal day. And so what an ideal day is you talking to yourself and mapping out, you know when you leave, like you go to bed at night and you've had the best day. And it didn't mean your students were behaving well or that you, you know, your principal gave you this huge great evaluation, but it was just something felt right. Look at that day. There was something about that day. What happened? Did you get a good breakfast? Did you wake up at the right time? Did you, were you not rushing to get to work? Um, was the sun shining? You know, um, did you get your exercise in? Did you have a, you know, supper? And like just seeing what is in your ideal day and like scripting it out. Like I will do this and then I will do this because a lot of times we're rushing around and I feel like that makes us cranky. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, so I feel like just scripting out what your ideal day, and it won't always happen, but you can strive to hit that ideal day more and more. And it's just really fun. It's kind of, um, I've been working with the same ideal day for about five years, and I look back okay. at old, like, versions of it, and it's still yeah. the same day I'm still mm -hmm. trying to achieve. Um, but at least it's awareness and um, and also being able to say, okay, this day is falling apart, and I'm going to switch gears, <laughs> which is even harder. <laughs> For sure. You know, I love that idea that it, it's it's just what I do. It's what I do, and and you say that to yourself because I know we lecture our students on a self fulfilling prophecy. You know, if you say that you're not good at something or you're going to fail or you're going to be horrible, then you're probably right. And the same can happen in the positive way. Um, that's why one of the things that really irritates me—it's a pet peeve—is 
and I try never to do this, but I've been doing kind of a bad job of it lately, is waking up and just think, oh my god, I'm so tired. I'm so exhausted. So I'm starting off the day with a mental note to myself, like, you have no energy left whatsoever. How are you ever going to get through this day? And I think it's just the words we tell us. If I were to wake up, and even if I were dog tired, and just like, oh, I'm going to get this day, you know, and just like high energy, like, I think that makes all the difference in the world. It's just your attitude, you know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and then kind of going on with uh, that idea of attitude, uh, we're getting to that point in the school year where a lot of teachers are really, really starting to drag. Um, so can you talk a little bit more um, about how that positive attitude can kind of get you through some of the tougher parts of, of what we do every day? Yeah, absolutely. It is a tough time of year, and um, students are kind of crazy and bouncing off the walls, and the weather's getting nice. And, um, I think, you know, it's kind of interesting, like, teaching, the profession of teaching has such peaks and valleys. Like, it's just, you're all in, and then it's over for a yep. while, and yep. it's just very much, like, um, erratic, I guess. Yep. But I, I think... A lot of times at the end of the year, what gets us more than the exhaustion is talking about next year. Yes. Um, I don't know if you found that, but it's like yes. by, I mean, March is maybe late. But everything's about like next year and who's moving to this school and who's going here and what are we going to have and what's my budget and what's my building. And, yeah. um, and it's just like that is out of your circle of control right now. I mean, we do need mm -hmm. to worry about next year, mm -hmm. but you're still in this year and you still have students to teach and you still have a report card to fill out for students this year. And yeah. they're not going to be with you next year. Some of them might move away. And so I guess I, I really encourage people to stay in this year and um, this idea of the circle of control. So there's some things that are within our control, some things that we can influence, and some things that are out of our control. And it's um, been found, it's the seven habits of highly effective people, that most of us spend a majority of our time in the circle that's out of our control because we're fired yeah. up big time. Yeah. And as art educators, too, I think that we're really emotional and passionate and we're right-brained. And, I mean, when someone says your budget's cut, like, it, it, it makes you – it makes it's bigger than just a dollar sign because oh, it means yeah. the arts aren't valued. It means you yeah. aren't valued. Yeah. It means that um, the future of our education is, you know <laughs> – not yeah. going to be rooted in the arts and there's so much more baggage with that than just a simple mm -hmm. dollar amount. And so we are I don't know if the PE teacher goes home and gets that fired up about it or the math teacher maybe. I feel like like art and music mm -hmm. we're like, you know, our hearts are in this profession. We got into it for a totally different reason. Yeah. And so because of that, we let that carry us away and we get out of our circle mm -hmm. of control. To so just to stay back to like what I always say what happens when you walk in the classroom door and when you leave the classroom door is what you can control. How you interact with students, the attitude you bring, the stories you tell, the personality you bring, no one can take that away from you no matter how little they give your budget. And it's hard, mm -hmm. but um, once you realize that, it just teaching becomes a little bit simpler. Um, and schools are kind of negative places sometimes, unfortunately. Yes. And I realized mm -hmm. that my second year of teaching. You know, all of a sudden I felt like I was gung-ho, this art teacher, I was going to go, you know, save the world with art. And suddenly... <laughs> Um, I was being drawn in to the trap and I was complaining yeah. too and I was getting mad at the administration and getting upset and it was like not me because I really didn't have a big beef with it but everybody got chirping. And so yeah. I put this sticky note on my computer and it said no complaining and it was in all caps and it was just my reminder to myself every day no complaining and um, I should probably put one on my computer now no. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that, that just you don't have to be part of it. You don't have to be negative just because people around you are. And you'll start to be the shining light. I mean, you'll start to rise above. And so, anyhow, those are some of my ideas for getting through that end of the year and um, yeah. knowing that that great feeling's coming when you do get to have a little break from your yeah. from your work. I think breaks are good. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that drives me crazy, I know I've said it before, is that commiseration of like, oh, only 12 more days left, and, and teachers love to kind of say that to each other. And yeah. and I understand where that sentiment comes from. You're tired, you're exhausted, but I've always thought the message you're sending to everyone else is that you hate your job. And yeah. your job is working with amazing kids. Like, just be quiet. Shut up. You don't get to say that, you know, and it really does irritate me. Or, and I even, I even it 
and it kind of gets to me when people are like, ah, oh, thank God it's Friday. Okay, I like Fridays too. <laughs> I love my family. But at the same time, when you show up on Friday and just say, can't wait, it's like, I just think we're sending the wrong message. There was a graffiti I saw once that said, kind of on the flip side, it said, it isn't Mondays that suck, it's your job. I was like, that's so true. Like, why do we believe that Mondays are horrible? Like, I get excited to go to work on Mondays. And, and I think the people that I respect and gravitate towards are kind of the same way. Like you said, Jess, like sort of those beacons of shining positivity. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah, hey, have, let's, oh, go ahead, Tim. Oh, no, that's fine. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say we, we've been doing some kind of looking in the past, and Jess said her perfect ideal day for the last five years has been the same, and we kind of talked a little bit about how AOE started, but I want to talk a little bit about the future. You know, Tim and I both have uh, conference presentations coming up soon for the uh, AOE mm -hmm. Summer Conference. I want to know, Jess, if there's any presentations that you're really, really excited to, to see, some new and exciting ones. And if you say Tim more than mine, I will <laughs> maybe never forgive you. I'm just going to go out and say that. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I'm really excited. It's always fun to see, you know, presentations that are coming up. There's always some old favorites, some AOE team members, and then some new new faces at the conference. Um, and some that haven't even been announced yet, but um, John Post is going to be back again, um, and he's going to talk about how to never blow anything up in your kiln ever again. So, spoiler wow. alert. Um, I need that one. It's totally pretty cool, that. yeah. <laughs> I had a couple this semester. Yeah. Okay, well, you have to come to the summer yeah, conference. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, and one of our featured presenters, I guess I'm just going to put it out there tonight and announce it for the first time, but um, is Cindy Foley. And she had this amazing nice. TED Talk on um, how to, you know, t teaching creativity and how what really is creativity. And um, I'll have to look up the title of that talk. But it took the art teacher world by storm. And she really oh, yeah. did it for TEDx Columbus. So it was just for everyone, like to not say not say to students, um, oh, you can draw really well. You must be so creative. Because that's mm -hmm. not, you know, creativity. And mm -hmm. she said that she was actually flabbergasted at the amount of art teachers that, like, came to her after this because she was speaking our language. And yeah. so she's going to elaborate on that TED Talk and then spin off of it for an AOE um, conference presentation. So I'm really excited to Very hear what cool. she has to say. She's, like, um, really, really... Um, awesome lady that I've gotten to know. So um, that's kind of a spoiler alert for one of our featured presenters, but uh, it'll be a lot of fun. I'm also really excited for the swag box. I mean, everybody loves swag, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so uh, <laughs> there's going to be, like, you know, full packs of things in the swag box this year, and people are really um, putting some – the companies have really come out and put some awesome things in there, like bulky things. So hope we have enough room yeah. in the box. We The stuff's starting to come and pile up to here, and we'll be putting it together in a couple of weeks. So it's always a fun, exciting time. It's like Christmas in July when the <laughs> AOE <laughs> conference comes around. So, yeah. Jess, one of the things that, you know, the three of us got together a while ago and kind of thought of this idea of putting a podcast on, we've had the, the luxury of getting to know a lot of outstanding teachers and, and, and you have also through AOE um, and, and we've been in contact with people through different things that we do with AOE but I wonder the, the sort of negative flip side of that is like teacher jealousy when you see this teacher that is just a rock star and you're just like ah, I'm not doing it as well as they are and I'm not as this or I'm not as that you know we've kind of talked about the the guilt of being a family person, a member, and, and a teacher. What about that teacher jealousy? How do you prevent that from creeping in when you deal with such amazing teachers? Um, absolutely, it creeps in um, because there are so, again, online brings it all to us. So mm -hmm. um, for me, I have found, like, and it's kind of cheesy, but like we all have our strengths. Like if you judge a fish's intelligence on its ability to walk or whatever that quote is, um, then you, he'll always be dumb in your eyes. So um, I guess the way I see it is that we all have our thing, and I call it our extra. Okay, so like every art teacher has an extra, whether it's um, connecting to art history, connecting to parents, using an iPad, um, putting on an art show, teaching technical art skills. Um, we all have this one, at least one thing that we feel like is kind of almost the reason we got into this profession and like our like reason for being as an art educator. And I always, you know, say think about your best extra, stick with it, and rock mm -hmm. it. 
So it's the idea of depth versus breadth because um, if you can go deeper and really, really hone in on one thing that you can do well, then you're going to get be the art teacher that rocks at the one thing. But if you're constantly trying to be everyone else, then you're never mm -hmm. going to be able to push past and get that balance out of out of whack to give that 80% to the one thing. And so I guess I just mm -hmm. uh, pick your best best extra rocket and then move on and then just applaud others for what they do. And I think one bad thing about jealousy, and I think we see it with our coworkers, with um, with everybody is that we don't applaud, we don't want to compliment someone. So someone posts something to Facebook and it's really hard for us to sit back and say, as just as people, um, that's awesome, good for you. Um, a lot of people tend to say things like, how do you have time to do that? And how did yeah. you, you know, I know Cassie, right. Steven gets a lot, Cassie Stevens gets a lot of that. And instead we can just be happy for people that they are happy in what they're doing and put our time and energy into doing something that we want to push to be great in, mm -hmm. our best extra, and rock it. And so um, I guess that's kind of what has helped me to compartmentalize because um, in my classroom my best extra was um, connecting with the parents. And I went out of my way by setting up tables at the front of the um, the front of the school and putting notes on the back of every single piece of artwork about what we learned and calling a parent every week with a positive note from about a student and things like that. And I felt like that was something I could latch onto and I felt good about and um, let the rest go. You know that idea of jealousy. It it reminds me of something that our school's been implementing, which is this idea of a growth mindset, which is yeah. um, uh, readings and writings by uh, Carol Dweck. Uh, and one of the things that she mentions is um, how we respond to others' successes. And there's lots of people who think like, well, if they get that piece of pie, there, there's no more pie for me. You know, <laughs> and 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 the reality is, is there's enough pie and success and happiness for everyone and just because someone else is getting theirs doesn't mean you didn't get yours so that growth mindset stuff I think is really really fantastic that's great that's great that's like the abundance mentality uh -huh. you know? yeah. the more good we all put out there the more good you know the more we'll lift everybody up so yeah, um. yeah I was going to bring that up about the growth mindset too and just what you just said just I beat you to me. it I beat you to it <laughs> I beat you to it <laughs> uh, but something that Ted Edinger says, you know, art with mystery, he always says uh, we're all better together. And I think that's, you know, the, the mindset that we kind of need to take. Everybody's got their strengths. And if we can just kind of applaud those people for, for what they do and take what we can, then that's usually the, the best way to go about that. So, All right, Andrew, any last questions before we hit the lightning round? No, man, I'm ready for the lightning round. All right. I'm ready. Okay, so oh <laughs> yes, even even the founder of AOE is not immune to the lightning round. Okay, so just uh, five quick questions and five quick answers. Andrew, hit us well, up. Well, and here's the thing I want to tell you, Jess. We gave you a list of five, and then we switched them all up. It's all different. <laughs> all curveballs. No, I'm just kidding. These will be easy for you. Okay, favorite music and the last song that you listened to recently, and it better be embarrassing. I hope it's embarrassing. No. Uh, I love Pandora, and I like to listen to music in other languages so I can concentrate on my work. So it would be the French Cafe station of Pandora. Very specific. Okay, nice. mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. All right. Uh, what is a place that you've never been but really want to travel to or go to? Um, right now, I'm kind of thinking summer, and I'm channeling the Bahamas. I've never been there, and I, it's like that whole, like, Go to a sandy beach. That's where I want to be. <laughs> okay, so as a parent of a young child, I know that sometimes this one is tough. What is the last great movie that you saw that wasn't a kid's movie? Well, my husband and co-founder, Derek Balsley, who is the, you know other half of AOE that people don't see, so I have to give him a shout-out. Um, this is probably, you know, the biggest... Uh, conversation in our marriage because I don't like movies. <laughs> and, I'm out. I'm uh, going to leave now. He, I'll see you guys later. He, I'm gonna, um, okay. he definitely loves movies and so it's a very you know tense point. So I'm going to get so much heck for this but um, I did take my daughter to her first movie in the theater and it was the new Annie and we loved it and it was really good so I will say that but um, yeah PG is I just stay right at PG and kids movies. and. <laughs> I think I, I need to musicals. come over and start. 
I need to start hanging out with Derek more and give him someone to watch movies with. Exactly. Please, thing. please yeah. do. I'm, I'm actually going to back you because my wife and I both do not watch movies. Uh, I think the last movie that we saw in the theater uh, was Bridesmaids, whenever that came out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's literally the last so time. See, this is the normal. Theater, this is so. normal, yes. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, you've been a teacher, and now you're doing the entrepreneurial thing with, with AOE. If you weren't doing what you're doing, uh, or if you weren't in the field of art education, what would your career be? Well, I always envisioned myself something creative, something artistic. I would probably either, I always said I wanted to just be a painter and, you know, be a mom. And so I can, that's kind of my, my thing. I just paint away the day um, and I haven't painted much lately but um, or maybe like uh, own a flower shop or something like that. Okay. Cool. Alright and then last one what are your favorite toppings on a pizza? Supreme baby all the way. <laughs> I like it all. <laughs> Alright sounds good and that'll conclude our lightning round so Jessica uh, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Anything else you want to say before Andrew mutes your microphone? Um, I just want to say, you know, thanks to all the AOE community for um, watching AOE Live and reading and for all the people behind the scenes, customer support, doing doing their thing on a daily basis. I think we're up to like 26 team members now um, working for AOE and bringing professional development to art teachers. And um, this show, you guys are a huge part of that, and it's been a blast um, to be kind of the first show, like, this in our dead and I just want to say thanks to everybody and thanks for having me and we're just going to keep having fun and um, you know rocking the art ed world together so thanks right. thanks, thanks a lot thanks right. Jess thank you thanks for coming on all right now we can talk about her this is my favorite part of the podcast like get them out of here and we'll just start talking smack about them <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I have anything bad to say though. Oh was, no, I don't have a good interview. Reason. That was awesome. That was great. Yeah. Now, by chance, did you get a chance to listen to that podcast she did a few weeks ago? I did. I did. That was really good. Um, and I know it's probably unprofessional of us to like plug another podcast, but <laughs> it's a really good one. And the one that she's on, and the one. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely an interesting listen. Yeah. So I yeah. I appreciate that a lot. It's it's a good show. Mm -hmm. so. For sure. Very cool. All right, so uh, what what were your big uh, thoughts on this conversation tonight? What did, well, what did you pull away from it? Well, you know, the whole time I kept thinking I was p listening to, like, a uh, professional motivational speaker, like someone who for a <laughs> living right. like, is, is a life coach and is going to whip me into shape and make me the better me and have my ideal day. But I think that's because of her tenacity and her outlook on life. She's just got yeah. – Jessica has this great energy, and, um, I mean, I don't think – you could do what she's done and not have that spark in her, that fire. Um, so I think about, you know, what she's been able to accomplish and, and how. You know, what are those strategies mm -hmm. she said? The myth of the work-life balance. Yeah. The compartmentalizing. The layering so that you can get kind of two things done at once. I mean, those are great strategies for maximizing your potential as a creative person and yeah. as an art teacher. Yeah. Yeah, and I think just the idea of trying to focus, you know, both day-to-day -day and big picture. Because mm -hmm. we talked a lot about, you know, finding what you are good at, playing to that strength, accentuating that strength. And so that's kind of the big picture takeaway, you know, find what you're best at and, and do more of that. But also just the day-to-day -day focus where, you know, you're not – because. Uh, you know, the whole right brain thing, just sort of these scattered thoughts and you're just wandering around the room aimlessly. And, you know, if you can eliminate that and be very focused on what you want to do day to day and, like she said, try and get out of there right at, you know, 3, 3.30, whatever mm -hmm. your, your time may be, um, I think that can make your life a lot easier. You know, and I, I used to be really preoccupied with this word and this thought and this way of being about a year ago, and I think it's kind of faded. And I think... I could boil down a lot of what Jessica is really talking about, about being present. Uh, being yeah. present for your family, being present for your students, for your kids, to your job, to your profession, but knowing when, okay, now I'm done with that, and now I need to compartmentalize, and now I'm being present here, and there's plenty of time to get back to this because I've structured mm -hmm. and I've organized, and it's not a chaotic mess. Like, I'll get back to that. And and I, I think that that idea of being present is is really great, and I think not enough people 
have it, get it, achieve it, strive for it, whatever. And I, I think yeah. it's such a, a great thing to try to get in your life, you know? Yeah, I think so. Just being present and being intentional about what you do. I mean, have, have your focus and, and, you know, rock what, rock what you can. Okay. So like, on that yeah. note, I got to ask you something. Cause I, okay. you know, I, it's such a simple idea. Like what's the thing that you're great at? And then like, right. Rock it. And then I, I think what can happen is, I'm so, you're so good at that one thing that you're good at that then you can build up the other things because you got that one thing. So what yeah. for you, what do you think is your one thing that you are just like natural, great, fantastic, that's my thing? Oh, man. Um, I think, I don't know if I'm necessarily great at it, but it's oh, what I... Oh, come on now, Tim. Don't be <laughs> modest. Um, no, I think writing <laughs> is, is a big thing for me. You know, not only with my blog, but, you know, what I do with AOE. I think just putting thoughts down and kind of reflecting on what I do is something that I think makes me a lot better teacher. And, you know, whether I'm just writing about what's going on day to day or whether I love interviewing people and turning those into, you know, articles or written pieces, mm -hmm. I love doing the writing thing. And then secondly is just, you know, I try and get my kids to create really strong work. Uh, and just, I feel like I teach drawing really, really well. And so, you know, I can teach kids to draw both technically and creatively. So I think, you know, just a mixture of writing and, you know, pushing my kids to produce some really strong stuff. So mm -hmm. back to you, what, what do you do well? What are you strong um, with? Uh, big, messy, creative fun. I mean, it's just <laughs> like, let's do this. Yeah. Why? Why not? And, and and there's just a lot of energy to it. And I I see connections yeah. from, oh, th my students will like this, and it's actually still also s in a sneaky way getting them some really good principles and elements in art history, but they don't even know it because I've kind yeah. of like, you know yeah. tricked them a little bit. So I definitely think my game is like the creative game. And then on the flip side, I know that my weakness is like organization and getting stuff turned in on time to everything yeah. and all that. So I, I think a lot of art teachers struggle with that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm probably, I'm probably more the typical art teacher of like big and messy and like, you know, the little stuff kind of, yeah, I'll get to that when I, when I want to. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, Hey man, we, we should wrap this up. Um, so yeah. that, that was a fun talk, but I want to tell people, you know, if you, you want to check out some of the links to what we've done on Twitter, you can definitely check out the hashtag AOE live or my feed or Tim's feed. Um, I'm going to be on um, Crowdcast for a little bit to answer any questions or chat with people for a little bit. After. Yeah, and uh, I just saw that Jessica is going to be on there as well. So if anyone has questions for Jessica, feel free to jump on there and and ask away. But uh, once we are all done and wrap this up, the podcast will be available on the AOE Live page. And by tomorrow, you should be able to download it on iTunes, the podcast app, and Stitcher for Android users. Listen to it on your commute, at home in the evening, or even during your plan time. I am Tim Bogatz, and on behalf of Andrew McCormick, thank you for joining us tonight on AOE Live. Goodbye, everybody. See you later.